your Bibles. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. We are going to observe the Lord's Supper tonight, so we're going to go to Luke's account of the, the instituting of the Lord's Supper when Christ was here on earth. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20 is the record of that account. It says, He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So we're going to reenact that tonight as we observe the Lord's Supper in a few moments. But to kind of prepare you for this, we're going to drop down and notice something that happened after they observed that first Lord's Supper. Because this is something that could happen to any of us. Drop down to verse 24. And there was also strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. That's talking about when Christ ushered in his millennial kingdom, what positions they would have in his kingdom. They were arguing about who would have the higher position. This is right after they take the Lord's Supper, by the way. Verse 25, Jesus said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. They that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat at the table. But I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. And he drops down to verse 31. And the Lord said unto Simon, Simon Peter, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he, Peter, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock, the rooster, shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Before the rooster crows, Peter, three times you will deny you even know me. This was right after they observed the Lord's Supper. This could happen to any of us this week. After observing the Lord's Supper and, and enjoying a very spiritual time together, we can go out in the world and do the same thing Peter did. Peter was sifted by the devil. What happened to him is a great lesson for us. Peter had just heard Jesus tell them how that they are going to reign with him in the millennial kingdom, sitting on thrones. That's pretty heady stuff, folks. Then, right after this, he says, By the way, Peter, Satan's after you. And before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. How do you think Peter felt when he heard that? I mean, one minute he's a hero, and the next moment he's a zero. I mean, one moment he's on a throne reigning with Christ, and the next he's denying he even knows the Lord. I believe what happened to Peter surprised him. You ever do things that surprise even you? You ever fail as a Christian? You ever fail with your testimony? And later you're surprised at what you did or said. Didn't even believe that you were capable of such a thing. 
Satan desired to sift Peter. And I got news for you. Satan also desires to sift you. There are three kinds of people here tonight. Those that have been sifted by the devil. Those that are right now being sifted by the devil. And those that one day will be sifted by the devil. You might be in all three. It's happened in the past, it's happening now, and it will happen in the future. Satan wishes to destroy your testimony. By the way, sifting is good for wheat. Yeah, does everybody know what sifting is? Sifting is getting the chaff out of the wheat. They would sift the wheat to get the chaff out. Sifting is good for the wheat. It's not good for chaff. Now, you've got you to gotta decide which you are. Are you wheat or are you chaff? The wheat will be gathered into the Lord's barn one day. The chaff will be burned. Right? Let's think about this for just a few moments tonight. Think of the sifting of the saints. First of all, if you want to take notes, the Lord predicted this. The prediction Jesus made concerning Peter's failure was, was pretty grim. Satan's after Peter to deceive him, and he's after us tonight. It's his desire to turn you inside out. It's his desire to turn you every which way but lose. He wants to destroy your Christian testimony. But the Lord shows us how to avoid that, how to overcome the works of the devil. Hey, you don't have to fail. Amen? You don't have to falter. You can be victorious. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 11, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, you Christians there in Corinth, whether ye be obedient in all things. Then verse 11, lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, at least you shouldn't be. Amen? You shouldn't be ignorant of his devices because God exposed them. Get into this book and you'll find out the tactics of the devil and how he seeks to destroy the people of God. We need to learn his tactics. Three, three, three kind of people that Satan will attack. First of all, Satan attacks stressful people. Now you think about what's going on here in Luke. These disciples are distressed. They're distressed by what Jesus is saying about dying and leaving them. They are disturbed when they are told that a traitor is among them. And they say, is it I? There's strife and division among them as they argue about who will be in the highest position. Then Jesus is arrested and taken off. Hey, pretty stressful time in that first church. And the devil takes advantage of that. He looks for that in a church. He's always on the lookout for offended, disgruntled members that he might use them to cause strife and division in a church. I, I want to remind you, the devil's a dirty fighter. I mean, he'll kick you when you're down. He'll attack you at your weakest. When things are not going well at home, when things are not going well at work or whatever, now, we might want to bring that with us to church, but we don't need to. Satan attacks stressful people. Secondly, he, has, he attacks strong people. He went after Peter, didn't he? Peter was the leader of the apostles. How, how would you describe Peter? What would be the strong traits of Peter? Here, here's that big, robust fisherman. I always thought of Peter as kind of a redneck. 
Amen. If he was around today, he'd probably drive a pickup truck with a rifle rack behind the seat and wearing boots and blue jeans. He's a tough dude. Hey, he's the one that pulled a sword and sliced off one of the guards' ears when they came to arrest Jesus. He was armed and dangerous, wasn't he? That's the kind of man Peter was. I would say he thought that his courage and fearlessness was his strongest trait. That's what he thought. And that's exactly where the devil attacked him. Before the devil's fire, a young maiden comes and identifies him as one of the apostles, and Peter denies him. And he denies he even knows the Lord Jesus. Peter did this. The leader of the apostolic band. And he never would have dreamed that he would do anything like that. Folks, be careful about watching a, a brother or sister stumble and saying, I would never do that. You'd be surprised what you'd do. Folks, if the circumstances are right, I've never stolen a million dollars, but I've never had the opportunity either. <laughs> Amen? You'd be amazed at what you might do. We hate to admit it, but we're capable of doing anything. We all fail. We all stumble. Just like Peter. And sometimes it surprises us. We say, man, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I just said that. Think of King David. King David was a man after God's own heart, right? One of the great men of faith in the Bible. David never ever dreamed he would be capable of committing adultery and murder, but he did. And my friend, don't you sit there and think that you're better than David. You're not more righteous than David. You don't love the Lord more than David did. And David fell. And it could happen to any of us. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore let him that thinks he stands, Take heed, lest he fall. Where you think you're standing strongest, the devil will attack that point. And you'd be amazed at what might happen. Then thirdly, Satan attacks strategic people. Peter was that leader of the apostles. He, he was a strategic leader. Actually, the word you in verse 31 is in the plural. The idea is that the devil was after all the apostles. But then he switches to the singular in verse 32 to point out and single out Peter. I prayed for you, Peter, because the devil wants you most of all. Here was Peter, the unofficial spokesman of that group. And if the devil could bring him down, he'd probably bring a bunch of others down with him. I thought about this. Satan goes after the leaders in our churches. Who would be the devil's primary target in a church? Who said youth pastor? Could it be the pastor? The pastor's family? By the way, that concerns me that I've got a bullseye on my back. And Matt's got a bullseye on his back and our wives and our family. Because the devil knows if he can ruin us and our family, he can do a lot of damage in the church. In 1 Peter 5, 8, and Peter's talking primarily to elders or pastors. Chapter 5, verse 1, he's addressing the elders. Then he says in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's telling the elders, you be vigilant. The devil is after you. Y'all need to pray for me and Brother Matt. You need to pray for our family need to pray for my wife and my granddaughter. The devil's after them. 
The devil, there's nothing more, Shelby, the devil would like to do than to destroy your testimony. Or my testimony, or Betty's testimony, or Matt and Kara's testimony. Right? Am I wrong here? All you need to pray for us. Because we're the main targets. He desires to sift us as wheat. Other leaders in the church, our deacons, our directors, our teachers, Jesus prayed for the apostles. We need to pray for our leaders. Let me say this, dads, I think you're a target too. You as the leader of your home, the devil would love to sift you men as wheat. He'd love to do that to destroy your home. Be careful. Hey, men, be vigilant. Be sober. The devil's after you. Hey, next Sunday's Father's Day. I was thinking about this a while ago because on Mother's Day, we always have a big crowd. We don't ever have a big crowd on Father's Day. I'll tell you the reason. Mamas tell their grown kids and grandkids, will not y'all come in and sit with me in church on Mother's Day? The mothers want their families with them at church. Dads take them to the lake on Father's Day. Shame on you, men, if you do that. I, I'm not kidding. Shame on you. If you're not leading your family right, and you're going to be off somewhere on Father's Day when you ought to take the lead and have them in the Lord's house. Our country is going under because we don't have enough men who are men of God. Secondly, I want you to notice this. Not only did the Lord predict this would happen, the Lord permitted this to happen. He permits it, number one, for our sake. Now, I've got some good news for you, folks. The devil, if you're a child of God, the devil cannot lay a finger on you without God's permission. That's good news, isn't it? Think about Job. God allowed the devil to sift Job. Satan had to get permission before he could do it. He could not touch Job without God's permission. He cannot touch you without God's permission. That's good news, isn't it? The bad news is sometimes God permits it. Now think about this. God allowed Satan, gave him permission to save Peter. I wouldn't do that. If the devil came and wanted my permission to sift any of you, I'd say, no. You're, you're welcome. No, you can't sift him or her. Now, does that mean I love you more than Jesus? No, it means I don't know as much as Jesus. Jesus will allow it for your sake. For your benefit. The devil came along, and here's old bragging Peter. And the devil says to Jesus, You know, I'd like to sift him. And the Lord says, You know, it's not a bad idea. I believe old Peter could use a good sifting right now. He needs to be humble, he's become too arrogant. So Christ gives the devil permission to sift Peter. But he limits what the devil can do. Just like he limited what the devil could do to Job. The devil wanted to kill him. The Lord's not going to allow that. But to a certain degree and measure, he allows the devil to sift Peter. Why? Because Peter needed a good sifting. He needed to go through the fire and burn off some of that chaff that had collected in his life. He needed to be refined or purified. Now listen to me. This book right here will do that. Everybody sit up and look at me. You get into this book and obey it, and it will cleanse you. But if you don't allow this to do it, then God's got to use other measures. If you don't let this do it, then you're going to get a good sifting. And you'll get it because you need it. There's times we just need, like Peter, we need a good sifting 
so that God can make us holy people. Sometimes you see a mother scolding her little boy who continues in to misbehave, and finally she gets a switch. The boy sees that switch, and he knows what that means. His little lips begin to tremble. Big tears run down his chubby little cheeks. And he's squalling, oh, mama, please, please, mama, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. Please don't spank me. Amen. And what loving, kind-hearted Christian mother could ever spank? A little angel like that. She says, okay, honey, mommy's not going to spank you this time. Now, mommy's being sentimental. Compassion would well the devil out of that kid. See, listen, God's not sentimental, but he's compassionate. He will discipline you in love and in compassion. He's not going to allow you to go on in rebellion and disobedience. If necessary, he'll let the devil sift you. He'll do it for our sake. Secondly, he'll do it for the sake of others. He'll do it for others' sake. He said to Peter, verse 32, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. It doesn't mean, Peter, you need to get saved. Peter's already saved. But he needed a different kind of conversion. To get back into the will of God where God can use him. And when you have gone through this and been strengthened, then I want you to help your brethren and strengthen them. That experience would help Peter down the line. It helped him to minister to others that are going through a hard time. Are you going through a hard time? Let me remind you of a couple of promises that God has made. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Whatever you're going through, God can take that and turn it for good. Probably use it to bless others. Also, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But with the temptation also will make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So that's a promise. God said, I will not put more on you than you're able to bear. He's going to limit what comes your way. Sometimes we go through difficulties. We go through trials and tribulations, and we come through it stronger on the other side, and in doing so, we can help others when they go through those hard times. Amen? Then, and final thought is, the Lord protects us in it. Jesus told Peter, I prayed for thee. Isn't it that comforting to know that the Lord, our high priest, intercedes for us in heaven? How would you feel if you knew Jesus was in the other room praying for you? Wouldn't that give you a good feeling? No, the Lord Jesus is in there praying for me. He's up there praying for you. He is our intercessor. He is our mediator between God and man. Remember this. Usually when you're going through the hardest times, the darkest times, is when you'll feel the Lord the most. His presence will seem greater when you're going through the hard times. Let me remind you, you've got as much of the Lord as you want. Some of you don't want much of him, and you don't have much of him. But he's available. And you can have as much of him as you want in your life. Amen. Let me close with this verse. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Talking about that high priest we have interceding on our behalf in heaven. 
He said, for we have not in a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our Lord has already been down that dark, lonesome path we're traveling. And he'll lead us through. Before we take the Lord's Supper tonight, we're going to have an invitation. I'm going to ask Brother Sam and the pianist to come. The Bible says that the Lord knows them that are his. He will chasten and discipline his own. Now I want to ask you this, do you belong to the Lord? Have you given your life and so to him as your Savior. Do you remember a time when you repented of your sins and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life? You placed your eternal destiny in his hands? Listen, if you need to be saved, we'd like to invite you to come and receive Christ today as your Savior. If you need baptism or church membership, We'd like to invite you to come. You know, to be an unbaptized, unchurched believer puts you outside the fold of God. You're outside, in many ways, of the protection that we have within a church family and a fold. It's God's will for every believer to be scripturally baptized and a member of a local church where they can serve him. Outside, you're in danger. The roaring lion, who does he pick off? He picks off those on the outside that are outside the fold, that don't have a shepherd, that don't have a, a flock to assemble with. 